All land animals originated in the sea, but then time and time again, many lineages of creatures have managed to find their way back. With natural selection then favouring aquatic forms, these creatures often readapted certain features like fins and fish-like bodies that made them successful in the sea once again. This has happened to birds, reptiles and mammals on more than one occasion. But strangely enough, the one group of animals that have been historically very bad at doing this are the amphibians. This is peculiar because amphibians are the one group of animals out of the list that are still adapted to live in aquatic environments, or at least still need to have access to moist environments to live. This means they are by nature just statistically more likely to be closer to an ocean, but also you'd think their bodies may have retained certain features that would make it easier for them to transition to life in the sea. Today, there is just one marine amphibian called the crab-eating frog that lives in brackish mangrove environments near river mouths hunting small crustaceans, and less than 2% of amphibians have been proven to be at least slightly saltwater tolerant. However, there was one time that amphibians not only entered the seas, but thrived and evolved into many forms around the world, and they were named the Traumatosaurids. While today amphibians are often small, until the evolution of the dinosaurs, giant predatory amphibians were a major component of almost all land ecosystems. These creatures are often referred to as the labyrinthodonts, but this name is more of an informal grouping, as they weren't necessarily closely related to one another. During the Triassic, some of the more land-based giant amphibians were in decline, but the semi-aquatic forms continued to thrive. The dominant group in the Triassic being the stereospondyls, which were large salamander-like animals. Today's amphibians, or the true amphibians, are known as the Lysamphibia, which had probably only just evolved during the Triassic, and were obscure. However, it is difficult to understate how successful the stereospondyls were at this time, with many different species being known from all seven continents, with many different body shapes and forms, ranging in size from a little bit larger than salamanders today, to colossal monsters that approach the size of saltwater crocodiles. They had a soft vertebrae, small limbs, and very large flat skulls with their eyes facing forward on the top of their heads. And at least one juvenile stereospondyl has been discovered with little external gills that were probably very similar to axolotls or the larvae stage of salamanders. All this showing they were heavily adapted to live in aquatic environments. The stereospondyls were thought to fill a niche similar to crocodiles, but since there were often many different species present in the same ecosystem, they were probably very adaptable animals, filling many niches. During the Triassic, the Earth was still recovering from the Permian extinction. As spoken about many times on this channel, the severely empty ecosystems were left behind, creating a vacuum for many animals to evolve and adapt very quickly, as they had little competition. So the first half of the Triassic is well known for containing many weird experiments of nature. The Permian extinction heavily affected the oceans too, and a lot of the same patterns can be observed in the fossil record of oceanic animals as well. First, you see a phenomenon known as disaster taxa, where the species that did survive the event have a brief period of very low competition, and so ecosystems can be dominated by high numbers of just a few species. In the oceans of the early Triassic, there were usually high numbers of specific species of fish and bivalves. After this, you start to see specialist creatures evolve to fill certain niches that are extremely unusual compared to other animals that have or will fill a similar niche. This is because there may be a more efficient strategy or body type that will do this job, but as there is so little competition, most mutations are saved, so extremely bizarre experiments in evolution are more likely to survive. However, some of these specialist creatures may become really successful and diversify, creating a new order of animals. Before we dive into this, I would like to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Mondly. Mondly is a language learning app that is filled with useful tools and games that help you tackle all aspects of language learning. There are 41 different languages to choose from, this includes very popular languages, but also ones less commonly learned, such as Farsi, Catalan, or even Afrikaans. These 41 foreign languages are also teachable from 33 native languages, all contained in the app. The audio materials used throughout the app are recorded by native speakers to ensure authenticity of wording and accent, but also while trying to learn a language, I have found digesting the rhythm and cadence of people speaking their native tongue to be incredibly important. The app also contains speech recognition that can offer instant feedback, which is how you can keep your pronunciation on track without the aid of a human teacher. The combination of these two features means Mondly will help you start developing a clear and correct accent in your chosen language from the get-go. 
Mondly is currently offering a 96% discount for lifetime access to all languages hosted on the platform in their winter sale. Access the sale through the link mondly.app forward slash mothlight. During the earliest parts of the Triassic, there were fish like Rebellatrix that was related to Coelacanth only had a giant forked tail that with other features show that it was probably a fast swimming predator, a complete contrast to living Coelacanths that are often relatively slow moving. The group of marine reptiles that would give rise to the ichthyosaurs first evolved in the Triassic. In the Jurassic, the ichthyosaurs would become so well adapted to a marine existence, they would evolve their distinctive fish shaped bodies. But in the Triassic, they still looked quite reptilian in body shape and in the absolute earliest parts of the Triassic, had a bizarre offshoot known as the Hoopersuchians that had an extremely unusual collection of characteristics. They had a long and thin body, ending in a flattened elongated skull, with no teeth, and had dermal plates running down their spine, a little like a Stegosaurus. So the oceans similar to land went through a period of severely empty ecosystems that gave many animals the opportunity to diversify, and this environment a group of stereospondyls named the Traumatosaurids evolved to enter the oceans. The first of these amphibians discovered was named Traumatosaurus, that was actually one of the first giant ancient amphibians found, being discovered way back in the Victorian period. As the understanding of these ancient creatures improved, it was eventually noted that Traumatosaurus were unusual because many of its fossils were uncovered from marine environments, and it was just the first of many diverse marine amphibians living at the time. The Traumatosaurids generally had quite a crocodile-like appearance, but whereas Traumatosaurus had fairly wide jaws, some, like a Phanorama, had significantly elongated jaws with needle-like teeth, similar to those of Garial crocodiles, suggesting it was a fish specialist. Amazingly, both of these creatures and several other Traumatosaurids had already evolved and achieved an almost global distribution by 250 to 245 million years ago, just a few million years from the Triassic Permian boundary. Almost every species of Traumatosaurid discovered are only known from their skull and due to this, little is actually concretely known about them. There is even debate whether they were just one family and there may have been multiple amphibians adapted to enter the sea around this time. However, what is known is that they were clearly marine animals in some capacity, at the very least to swim between river mouths or as part of their life cycle, because their remains are heavily associated with other sea fossils. Some individuals have been discovered in freshwater ecosystems as well though, so they may have been capable of adjusting to different salinity levels, which is actually rare in nature. While the vast majority of traumatosaurids are now just skull remains, at least one traumatosaurid is known from a complete skeleton. Certain features of its skeleton has led researchers to believe it could have been a strong swimmer, swimming by undulating its body side to side like a crocodile. Its skull was also very specialised and shares characteristics with mosasaurs, so it might have been a fast moving marine predator, actively hunting prey in the sea. The Traumatosaurids were very successful and proliferated into many species in an incredibly short amount of time by geologic standards. There is a hip bone known from China that is thought to have belonged to a Traumatosaurid dated to the Middle Jurassic, meaning they may have survived well into the dinosaur era. However, by and large they declined soon after they evolved, their fossils being increasingly less common by the Middle Triassic. So why is this the only known time that amphibians managed to disperse into the sea? Well, just because amphibians are superbly adapted to freshwater doesn't necessarily mean they are adaptable to live in the ocean. Amphibians have very permeable skin, or at least much more permeable than any of the other land vertebrates, mammals, birds, and reptiles. They not only receive a large quantity of their overall oxygen from their skin, but absorb many substances including ions like sodium. The benefit of this is it requires less energy for them to breathe, and absorb essential minerals than other animals. The disadvantage is that it makes them sensitive to their surrounding environment. An unadapted amphibian dropped in the ocean would dehydrate incredibly quickly. As reptiles and mammals adapted more and more to drier habitats, they had to become better at retaining water in their bodies, and one of the ways this was achieved was by becoming less permeable to reduce water loss. When a select few lineages adapted back into the sea, this would have helped them adapt to live in a salty environment. Of course, mammalian skin may be less permeable, but marine mammals do still absorb some sodium, but have evolved ways of dealing with this like specialised kidneys that excrete much more salt than other mammals, and marine reptiles and birds have developed salt glands to solve the same problem. An amphibian would just need to work much harder to achieve the same results. This is a dilemma faced by amphibians before we have even gotten to competing with other marine animals that have evolved in the sea for millions of years. 
So ironically, it may actually be the amphibians' brilliant adaptations to freshwater ecosystems that creates a larger barrier to adapting to life in the sea. And the fact that marine mammals and reptiles were adapted to land at one point may have actually made it easier for them to make the transition. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. And thank you again to Mondly for kindly sponsoring this video.